Good evening. This microphone is actually for the live streaming we're doing tonight. I think the room could accommodate us without the use of the microphone, but I'd like to welcome you to... Oh. I like, so it, this actually isn't plugged into speakers. Um, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's Shift Speaks. This is the speaker series that we're using to establish the foundation for the Shift Festival in October. How's the volume in the back of the room? Pontier, can you hear? No. It is on. It's broadcasting. <laughs> I'll shout. Um, my name is Christian Beckwith. I'm the director for Shift, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here tonight. We are live streaming tonight's talk on Facebook, so a warm welcome to our online visitors as well. And before we begin, in particular, I'd like to thank Mike, who's running our live streaming. Meg Daly, who coordinated this event as she did the last one with Juan Martinez in July. And of course, our programming partner, the National Museum of Wildlife Art, who opened up their beautiful space to us for this event here tonight. So SHIFT was commissioned by the Jackson Hole Travel and Tourism Board as part of their mission to develop Jackson's year-round economy. The goal was to create an event with a triple bottom line to increase tourism in October, while also bringing value to our community and to the environment in which it exists. So tonight, we're excited to announce not only our speaker, but also the dates and venues for the first Shift Festival, which will take place over Columbus Day weekend, October 11th through 13th. On Friday, October 11th, at the Center for the Arts, Shift is partnering with Slow Food in the Tetons to celebrate the relationship between people and food. Pairings of local foods and libations will be open to all ages on the center's grounds before we move into the center's theater for a food-focused film festival. <laughs> Three times fast. <clears throat> then on Saturday, October 12th, this one is close to my heart, we'll move to the Pink Garter Theater for a celebration of adventure. And what we're looking at on this night, on Saturday, is um, the legacy of conservation that is developed among adventurers from John Muir to, da to David Brower to Yvonne Chouinard to Jeremy Jones. So we'll have an evening of film and inspiration that ends with a collaboration that we're doing in conjunction with Teton Art Lab's Caldera Concert Series and an all-ages show by DJ Dan Deacon. Then on Sunday, we're coming back here to the National Museum of Wildlife Art, where we'll be using hunting and its relationship to conservation as our programming theme. We're very grateful to our programming partner, the National Museum of Wildlife Art, for this opportunity. Really, the programming is part of a, of a bigger picture. We want to use the Shift Fez Festival to develop solutions to problems that we're seeing in the relationship between humanity and, and nature. So in order to address that, we're developing initiatives that foster that balance. We're currently develop, developing these in conjunction with the Murray Center and the Teton Science School. We'll announce these initiatives at this year's Shift Festival and then debut them at the full launch of the festival in October 2014. So this collaborative approach that we're taking is um, central to Schiff's mission. We all live in Jackson for reasons that are very particularly our own. Those reasons are often as diverse as they are impassioned. Rather than focus on anything that might divide us, what we're focused on are those common interests that help us to move the entire con conversation forward. Perhaps no one is better positioned to address such a collaborative approach than tonight's speaker. A native of Moose, Wyoming, John Turner is a third generation rancher who with his brothers runs, as you well know, Triangle X Ranch in Grand Teton National Park. Mr. Turner served for 19 years in the Wyoming State Legislature, including as President of the State Senate. 
Between 1989 and 1993, he served as the director of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, where he was responsible for expanding collaborative approaches under the Endangered Species Act, increasing wetland protection, and establishing 55 new national wildlife refuges, the most of any administration in the nation's history. From 1993 until 2001, Mr. Turner was president and CEO of the Conservation Fund, a national nonprofit organization dedicated to public-private partnerships to protect land and water resources. With the support of over 200 corporations, during Mr. Turner's tenure, the fund protected more than 2.8 million acres of parks, wildlife habitat, and open space across America. Am I getting this all right? Yeah. In 2001, President George W. Bush nominated Mr. Turner to be the Assistant Secretary of State for Oceans, International Environment, and Scientific Affairs. It's an honor to have him speak here tonight on behalf of SHIP. Please join me in welcoming Mr. John Turner. <laughs> Thank you. Chris, thank you very much, and thank the folks at Ship Festival and folks here at the museum. Uh, it's an honor for me to, to visit with you all, welcome you, and thank you for sharing your evening with us. I want to, uh, I see a lot of old friends here, but I want to issue a, a special welcome to some students here uh, from the University of Wyoming. They're affiliated with the School of Environment and Natural Resources becoming recognized all over the country as, as one of the finest. These students are here for a week of orientation, Jackson Hole and the Issues. I'd like to welcome the students. And Dr. Andy Burke, uh, probably one of the best uh, deans anywhere in the United States in Environment School of Natural Resources. Welcome. <laughs> I've been uh, fortunate to be affiliated with the University of Wyoming over oh, the last couple of decades. I didn't go there. Like a lot of Wyoming students, I had to go out and see the world. But uh, through my work down there, I've really become to realize what a great institution our only four-year college is. I recall uh, about a decade ago, I was down there. Uh, I chair a wonderful board called the Ruckles House Institute, and I was there with early in the morning in a small Wyoming cafe with Bill Ruckel's house, who served as a prominent uh, first administrator of EPA, president of the university, uh, Dr. Dubois. We were planning the day's agenda. And over pretty close to us was a table of ranchers. Uh, you could tell they'd owned that table since statehood. <laughs> Gather, I mean, they had s sweatbands and and they kept looking at me, and, and, and I could tell they were talking about me. And I got a little huffed up about that. I thought, you know, one time people thought uh, G. Turner might be a candidate for governor, been president of the Senate, has gone off to Washington. And so I, I got feeling pretty good about that. And when I paid my bill, and one of those old ranchers followed me up to the cash register, and I turned around, and he didn't look very happy chewing on a match. And he poked me in the chest. He says, hey, he said, anybody ever tell you you look a lot like John Turner? <laughs> and yes, I'd been involved in dangerous species stuff and putting a plan together to reintroduce wolves in Yellowstone. And, uh, and I said, well, well, matter of fact, he says, I'll bet that makes you madder than hell, doesn't it? <laughs> All right. Well, getting, getting down to tonight's topic, at another class I was teaching at the university, privileged to be a visiting professor, visiting with some graduate students, <clears throat> what they call their capstone series. It's a wonderful program where engineering students, law students, ag, business come together, get a, a, a collaborative multidiscipline degree, also in affiliation in environment and natural resources. And I was making some profound observation about environmental protection conservation and this one gal was just wiggling in her seat and frowning and pretty soon her hand shot up and she said but Mr. Turner she said you're talking about environmental protection and conservation but but you're a Republican. 
So thus, I guess, uh, I was asked to talk about uh, my belief that conservation is indeed a conservative philosophy. That's the first thing I'd like to talk about. Second is uh, I think Republicans uh, here in Wyoming and, and down through our history in the country have a superb record. And third, I'd just like to share some the Turner principles of conservation uh, that I think perhaps we could all share. You could make up your own list. I really think it's a myth, a persistent myth, that seems to be perpetuated by some of our friends in the media, some of my liberal friends, and some environmental groups that conservation, environmental protection are all liberal causes. And I submit to you uh, that's absurd. What I mean by conservation, uh, pretty simple. One, it means budgeting your resources long term, conserving your assets frugally for the future. Second, it means we have the personal freedom and liberty to take responsible for our own actions. And third, it's accepting a moral responsibility we have to our grandkids and their descendants. That's just my simple, at least my feelings about what a conservative philosophy, at least some beds. Um, I grew up in a conservative environment, as many as you do, as Chris mentioned. Uh, I was privileged to be born and raised at the Triangle X. And when I was a youngster, uh, we lived, like a lot of people in Jackson Hole, uh, it was a way of life that had disappeared from America in the 1880s and 1890s. Uh, we didn't get electricity till 1953, uh, so no power. Uh, you had to husband your fuel very carefully, uh, your firewood, or you didn't make it through the winter, to cook, to do laundry. Uh, I remember we only heated three rooms, the kitchen, the bathroom, and the family sitting room. I can still remember as a kid going into my bedroom and crawling beneath a stack of sheets when the bedroom was often below zero. So you conserve fuel. You conserve food. You started out <clears throat> when winter came with all your food because you were isolated. We went to Jackson twice a year. It was a three-day trip by sleigh. Uh, so the vegetables you can, the beef you shot, the elk you shot, the fruit you can, that was your winter vegetable, so you conserved your food. You always, of course, conserved water. Any ran Wyoming rancher can tell you, you, you use your water judiciary or you, you, you're out of business. Uh, you conserve your pasture lands. You've simply got to have enough pasture, your livestock, to make it through the summer and fall before you have to put them on hay. There's one phrase I like. Um, when I was a kid hanging around the shop, I can remember my dad and my granddad always saying, some of our hands, save the parts. Save the parts. What they meant was if something got broken down or worn out, you didn't throw it out, you saved the parts. The bolts, the metal, the springs, the cables, the wheels. And I was surprised how often as I was growing up, that stuff was put to use. Something broke down. You didn't have the cash. You didn't have the means to haul something to a mechanic, order new. You had to get the job done. Had to get the hay done. Had to get the ditches clean. Whatever you were doing. And I think save the parts is something, a good theme that those of us interested in wildlife conservation agree with. I think it works in protecting biodiversity. We need to protect the genetic storehouses. Uh, the ecological process in this species. Not only do we share the landscape with them and depend on it as they do, but these are the critters that could be breakthroughs in, medical, uh, in medicine and, and technology and so forth. So I think, uh, like a lot of ranchers and farmers, I grew up uh, in a conservative way. I think uh, conservatism was a genetic mutation in my family anti-government, resistant to regulations. Some of that still resides today. Um, I've always tried you know, on the conservative side to be fiscally conservative, to 
preserve personal freedoms, honor deeply private property. Uh, I'm a strong supporter of right to life. I'm a strong supporter of the sanctity of life. And I'm a strong supporter of protection options and opportunities for my grandchildren and future generations. I had the honor of being elected to the Wyoming State Legislature in 1969. I was a graduate wildlife student back at the University of Michigan, working on a PhD in wildlife. And I experienced that things had a profound impact on me. The University of Michigan at that time was literally on fire. Uh, the protests, the rioting against the Vietnam War, the, the demonstrations for civil rights. The campus was really ablaze in anti-government, anti-establishment, anti-capitalism. <laughs> and for a young cowboy from Moose, Wyoming, that was an experience, because I was challenged <laughs> every day about what I thought I believed. And, but I got interested in public policy. So I came home in 1869. The, teeter, uh, the voters of Teton County took a chance at a young wildlife biologist who ran on an ecological platform. Fortunately, nobody knew what the hell it meant. <laughs> Teton County was a different place there, Paul. It was a different place then. Heavily Republican. My Democratic friends used to say they met in a phone booth. Uh, I think they probably met at a couple tables out at Stearns. Uh, but of course, that's changed. Our population has grown. Our development, we've got a lot more development. Uh, in the old days, the livestock community here was vibrant. Uh, active throughout the valley. The big game fall hunting uh, was a great shoulder season. It was a very vibrant fall economy. It kind of interests me now that we're looking for things to boost our fall economy when big game hunting used to provide the fall economy for Jackson Hole. Teton County, when I was elected to the Wyoming legislature, was the poorest county in the state of Wyoming. The assessed valuation of this county is equal to about two of our box store outlets here. Uh, the county had no money. Schools had no money. I went to school in a log cabin at the base of uh, Snow King. It was the ski shelter at Snow King. Got in a lot of trouble up there. Uh, the town didn't have any money. Ralph Gill, I remember trying to piggy bank a few enough money to, to pave the notorious potholes that were on every street in Jackson uh, when the snow melted in the spring. So times have changed. Well, that's enough history. Let me get back uh, to take a stab at what the record of Republicans are in conservation. And I think I'd like to start here in Wyoming, where hopefully Grant would agree that down through Wyoming history, the state legislature has always been heavily Republican, uh, at times maybe perhaps too much. But heavy Republican. And I think today Wyoming citizens benefit from and perhaps take for granted the superb environmental laws that this state has. Uh, air quality programs, water quality programs, industrial siting that may have a heavy impact on communities, uh, land reclamation for all our open pit mining, up-to-date and current wildlife management tools and laws, the mineral trust fund, where we put billions aside of revenues from today's mineral extraction to benefit future generations. The Wildlife Resource Trust Fund, solid waste management, hazardous wake, leaking fuel tanks, the list goes on and on. Now all those measures, grantedly, were worked on bipartisanly, but they were all passed under re Republican leadership, conservative, ranchers, real estate, farmers, oil and gas, people, bankers, and that is it should be. Uh, it's appropriate that the Wyoming legislature do this. That's the way our system works, because Wyoming people who are also Republican, heavily Republican, care deeply about the, their rivers and their streams, their natural landscapes, and a wildlife complex that rivals anywhere in the world. And we're blessed with that here in Jackson Hole.
Part of the time I was in the legislature, 15 of the 19 years, I had the opportunity to represent not only the great people of Teton County, but I represent the wonderful folks in Sublette County, the Upper Green River Basin, and the whole uh, complex, the wonderful LDS communities over in Star Valley. Very conservative populations that again and again supported me and the mischief I was up to. Uh, the Upper Green River Basin, those that know it, uh, sustains one of the nation's largest remaining livestock multi-generational family uh, complexes anywhere left in the nation. Uh, Hard-working, people have been there over 100 years, uh, cow and calf operation, believe me, they are conservative, rock solid conservative. Uh, they're advocates of property rights, freedoms, uh, anti-big government, anti-extreme environmentalism. But today there's something going on in Sublette County I, I want you to be aware of. Uh, as has many of the old ranching families in Jackson Hole who are also quite conservative. These old ranchers in the Upper Green are quietly involved in a conservation effort uh, that's significant in Wyoming's history. Uh, just one example, uh, my good friend uh, Luke Lynch of the Conservation Fund working with the Wyoming Agricultural Land Trust, the Wyoming Game and Fish, the Wyoming Re Natural Resource Trust Fund, and several fed federal agencies, they've already protected over 40,000 acres of uh, key wildlife habitat and, and uh, watershed protection on the Upper Green, but a 30, another 30,000 acres are under contract and in play. Uh, this is fabulous moose country. It's great elk winter range. It's, it's uh, world premier uh, native trout fishing, and it's really critical sage grouse habitat. Uh, I want to salute one family down there because I was somewhat involved. The Carney family uh, protected uh, their ranch on the Upper Green. Now why that's so critical, that's the hourglass that our antelope, our pronghorn herd out of Jackson Hole, the Grand Teton herd, that was the hourglass, the weak link that we were all worried about is now protected thanks to the Carney family conserving that for posterity. Uh, the longest big game migration route left in the lower 48 states. Uh, closer to home, I, I've got one incident that I just have to mention. Uh, closer to home, a little background. Wilderness designation is a very critical emotional issue. The majority of the Rocky Mountain states have been fighting over wilderness designation for almost 30 years, since as Jim Watt would remember, rare one and and rare too. They cannot get their act together, nor do they have a leadership to straighten out what will be wilderness and what will be multiple use forest lands. Wyoming settled there three decades ago, thanks to some hard work, very persistent people here in this community like Don McLeod and Phil Hawker, representative for the Sierra Club. But the real, uh, and of course our delegation got behind it, Sir Simpson, Sir Wallop, and our Congressman Cheney. But there was one individual that was key to it. And an environmental friend came up the other day and said, you know, this individual has never been recognized in Jackson Hole or, or never really been thanked for what he did. It took a lot of diligence. It took a respected conservative who was willing to push the Wyoming Wilderness designation, a proposal we all worked on with this great treasure across the valley here, the Grovant landscape, became wilderness area because of the hard work, the diligence, the interest, the caring of Congressman Dick Cheney. If you see him, thank him for that. It was a great gift. I also might mention that as Vice President, he was key to a, absolutely key to a measure we were all working on for stewardship of the Chesapeake Bay. On a national scale, I uh, hope you'd all agree that the U.S. has led the world on many fronts of environmental protection and conservation. 
uh, to ensure sound stewardship of the great natural resources with which we're blessed. Uh, in my opinion, it's one of our great inventions and one of our great gifts to the work of the world. When I was the State Department, I traveled all over the world. People wanted to learn, copy, emulate what the United States has done on so many fronts. But this is as it should be, because we're blessed with a great abundance. Also, we have a system of government that could, that can and did reflect the interests of the American people that care about these resources. It's safe to observe that the majority of our programs, laws, and packages were passed on a bipartisan basis. But I submit to you the majority of these programs that we all cherish were done under Republican presidents. I'll just mention a few things. Teddy Roosevelt, of course, stands alone as a champion of wildlife, as a patriot for public land stewardship. He said conservation is a great moral issue for it involves patriotic duty of ensuring the safety and continuance of our nation. He truly believed that. Uh, skipping along, I want to mention, in spite of his serious transgression, President Nixon has to go down as one of our best environmental presidents. Under President Nixon's leadership, we got the Endangered Species Act, the National Environmental Quality Act, outline of DDT and, and many other things that were controversial at the time. I want to mention President Reagan because he passed one of the most important unheralded environmental laws we have that he felt he took on real estaters and realtors, developers and everything else and passed the National, the National Marine Conservation Act. And what that did in a good Republican fashion, it's a good model we all need to think about, he said, if you're going to build in our coastal areas, and we can, we've all seen the tremendous damage, cost to the taxpayers, damage in coastal areas, if you're going to build where we have pristine beaches, tidal marshes, coastal barrier islands, you go ahead, but you'll have no federal protection. That has been, it saved millions of acres of our, of our coastline. It's too bad it didn't come many decades before. I had the pleasure, as Chris mentioned, uh, serving President George H.W. Bush. He, of course, with Al Simpson's help and others, uh, passed a pretty formidable Clean Air Act. And it was mentioned he established more national wildlife refuges than any president in history. Uh, I might mention, just because of my bias, but uh, there's more acres in the National Wildlife Refuge System than there is in the National Park System. Uh, George Bush felt passionately about wetlands, and he really turned the tide on our loss of wetlands across the country. It was also his administration that put together the plan for the reintroduction of wolves in the Yellowstone ecosystem. George W. Bush has never really been appreciated for what he did on the sustainability front. Few people recognize that George W. Bush administration gave more financial aid from the United States to developing countries at any time in our history. It was bigger than the Marshall Plan. It was larger than President Kennedy's, uh, what was it called? Pro Partners for Alliance, Progress for Alliance, or whatever. And he did it on many fronts, uh, multiple initiatives that I was involved in and others, but uh, to address infectious disease and the fact that we have a child dying in, somewhere in the world every eight seconds from contaminated water. So access to fresh water, access to basic energy, uh, dealing with rule of law, law, empowering women. We made a special effort on tropical forestry, cut down illegal logging, illegal trade in wildlife, but in tropical forest, we did a partnership in the Congo Basin, which established 27 new national parks and protected over 25 million acres of the Congo Basin. Great eight habitat, elephants, surfing hippos, etc. Uh, 
I'm tempted to talk about some corporations, but I think I'll skip that. Uh, just to mention a couple, I happen to serve on the board of International Paper, largest paper and packaging company in the world. They alone, uh, through their history, have protected over a million acres of land across the United States. Great corporate heritage. Uh, I just have to, because I was talking about sustainability, Walmart, because of its buying power and determination, is really changing the way we think about sustainability worldwide. So hopefully uh, a few of you might agree that uh, con conservatives and Republicans uh, have a good record on conservation. Those that are doubtful, I invite you maybe to put together a list of what's been passed under liberal leadership, and we'll compare them. Republicans and conservatives obviously have a lot of room for criticism. Uh, you know, when you say conservation is conservative philosophy, uh, it makes my liberal friends very nervous. And it makes and a lot of Republicans either want to ignore it or cut and run from it. Uh, and I have a few battle scars in the backside of such encounters. So we all need to, regardless of what party they are, is, is, is get after them when they deserve it, but give credit where credit's due. Uh, bottom line, I think conservatives and Republicans have a very credible record. I'm proud of it, and I'm proud of the values it represents. Okay, a few comments on Turner Principles. A few comments on Turner Principles. <laughs> They're having trouble back there. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and you can agree or disagree with these or make up your own. Uh, my first principle is we need to think systems, systems. Uh, no longer is it, is it worthwhile just to look at one critter or one piece of track. We need to look at larger landscapes, entire watersheds, but not just natural systems. We need to look at social and economic systems because they all intertwine. My second principle is we need more good science. There's no substitute for good information to address the serious and complex environmental issues we have. We need good science at all the levels, local level, state level, federal level. I can't help but mention that when I was director of the Fish and Wildlife Service, I resigned over an issue. And it was an action which I think set the lands we care about, those under National Park Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, Bureau of Land Management, Department of Interior. Uh, when President Clinton and Vice President Gore ripped all the science out of those agencies. It's, it set those agencies back 50 years. Uh, that, agent, that science was plucked into an independent entity that I submit today is irrelevant. Uh, is not there to answer the questions that managers need. They're not there to work the problems that managers have to work with on complex issues. Plus, as we predicted, those agencies, as they must, are now duplicating that science and building it back again in their own ranks. Fiscally absurd. Principle number three, we need more education and training. Uh, I sometimes wonder if a lot of our citizenry is not ecologically illiterate. Uh, you need, we need to be informed on these issues, dig deep, look at the science, look at the facts, and just, just not go on emotion and our shallow whims. It'll lead us up the wrong path. Training, we need practitioners in private sector, government, nonprofit, who have multidisciplinary skills and collaborative skills. Uh, that's the kind of training we need for people involved in these issues. And fortunately, that's what UW is doing under Dr. Burke's leadership in the School of Environment and Natural Research. Multidiscipline and collaborative learning. My fourth principle is uh, bottom-up is best when possible. Bottom-up is best. 
Our best solutions come when they're community-based. Uh, when we approach something and incorporate local interests, local commitment, and I can't help but look to the example of land trusts. 1,700 land trusts across the United States. We have one of the premier, premier ones here with the Jackson Hole Land Trust that have brought this community together, real estate, people, ranchers, oil and gas, have brought us all together, philanthropy, and protected so much of the open space in Jackson Hole. I need to put in a plug that the land trust this fall will be doing a partnership with the fine, some of our fine arts people where paintings and land protected will, uh, will have an event this fall. My fifth principle in environmental and conservation issues, we need to think dollars and jobs. Too often, uh, we don't look at the economics of an issue. Uh, politics drives a lot of the controversy and environmental policy, and I submit to you economics concerns drives the political concerns. So we need to look at real costs and benefits and what the impact is on jobs. Most successful strategies stop and look at the impact on the economy, locally and elsewhere. Six, uh, we need more partnerships. I'm such a strong belief, and when you bring people together, the private sector, the nonprofit, government, whomever, and do things collaboratively, bring, bring people's wants and needs and resources together, it's certainly been a central theme of mine, what I've tried to do in 35 years of public service. Number seven, uh, I put down dance with a gal of Brunia. Uh, that, that's an old Western saying, but by those I meant the traditional partners in conservation. It's ranchers, it's farmers, it's foresters, and it's sportsmen. Uh, sportsmen, well, some of you might not want your daughter to marry somebody that dresses in camouflage. <laughs> but I tell you, sportsmen, have done, along with the National Land Trust, have protected more acres in the private sector across America than any other group. It's billions of dollars and millions of acres that hunters and fishermen put into conservation. Plus, they have a great deal of credibility in the political arena, often considerable more than some of the environmental groups. Number eight uh, is an obvious one to people in Jackson Hole. We all need to to work and live more sustainably. How we use energy, water, resources, chemicals, whatever. We Americans uh, especially need to do that. And I'm proud of what this community has done, thanks to the initial leadership, people like Jim Wolfenson and others. But uh, Jackson's become a, a real leader. And when I was at the State Department, I got to head up the administration's efforts in sustainability around the world. And one thing I learned is that sustainability is a multi-leg stool. You can't do environmental one of the legs if you don't look at economic sustainability. People need income, they need a job, especially where they make a dollar or two a day. You have to look at social sustainability. You have to direct education and health. And probably the padding on the seat is you need rule of law and good governance, and you need security. Number nine, I think, is an obvious one. In conservation, we should check our partisan guns at, at the door. Too many groups, I think, try to mix their partisan priorities with their environmental priorities, and I think they lose credibility. Their friends ends up taking them for granted, not listening to them, and their unnatural or opposition partners uh, don't have much respect for them. An example, when I was so apoplectic, truly apoplectic over the, to move the science out from under management, the land agencies, Department of Interior, 
I went to a lot of my environmental friends and they knew it was wrong. Some of the very prominent ones that care about wildlife conservation on public land and tried to get them involved. Uh, they sat it out. They said that we can't criticize our friends. Principle number 10, uh, obviously we need to engage the disenfranchised in co conservation environmental protection. It cannot be a white Caucasian movement. We have to enf enfranchise and involve the people of color, the black people, the brown people, the urban people of, of this community, of this, of the globe. Number 11 is we all need to work to preserve wildness. I'm not talking about wilderness, though I'm a, an admitted addict for wilderness. Uh, I'm talking about uh, natural processes and genetic storehouses, natural landscapes, uh, the vast diversity, the biodiversity with which we share this earth. My last principle, and one I think that maybe is the most enduring, a few of you might think now Turner's really gone berserk, uh, but it may be the most enduring. I submit, maybe it's not the right phrase, but I say we need more spirituality. We need more spirituality. Now, by spirituality, I'm not talking about religion, although I think uh, Faith-based people have an important role, and it, they're a welcome addition across the globe in the environmental movement. I think what I'm talking about with spirituality, I'm talking about morals. I'm talking about values. I'm talking about how we all behave in this arena and how we make choices between what we decipher as right and wrong. What I'm talking about is coming together, listening to one another, building consensus based on respect around values we all share, our shared values that relate to community, a respect for neighbors, a mutual passion we all share for landscapes and the critters that occupy it a mutual gratitude for the blessings that we all have. I think this is where we find the common ground and build solutions, is in this arena. I often think that this was the core principle and character that transcended two of my heroes, your heroes, in the environmental movement. Two people I was able, privileged to follow around as a tyke, and that was Marty and Olus Murray. They had that character, that value, that respect of others. Well, in closing, I think it's all worthwhile, as we, I hope we all do, that conservation, the protection of wild resources, has indeed been one of America's great contributions and gift to the world. And it's kind of nifty to contemplate that it all be, got its beginning a few miles north of here on the Firehole River. In 1872, with the establishment of Yellowstone, American people became the first people in world history not only to set wild resources aside for their own intrinsic value, but based on our democratic values, we also said they were the benefit and enjoyment of the entire citizenry, in spite of their wealth, in spite of their status. That was an amazing invention and an amazing gift to the world. So the creation of Yellowstone, in my opinion, led to what's unfolded since, the creation of our great national park system, our great national wildlife references, our great expanses of wilderness areas, uh, wild and scenic rivers, the Endangered Species Act, it goes on and on. But based on that initial value, that these are things worth saving because they have value and they should benefit all Americans. 
for generations to come. So I think those of us who live here can be especially proud because we live in the heart of that heritage. And our obligation is to figure out how together we nurture and care for it. Thank you all. Are we doing questions? Questions, complaints, criticism. <laughs> Charlie. Okay, Owen, you know what? I'm going to have you talk into this mic. It won't, it won't make a lot of sounds, but it really is. John, you, you mentioned the, the great environmental work that uh, many American presidents have done. And I would like to first of all thank you for the personal work that you have done for this country and, and for the world. Thank you so much. And, and my question uh, is about water. You mentioned the importance of our uh, wild rivers and, and of pure water. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the relation of water and the Clean Air Act. My understanding is that water was deliberately not included in that act, and, and the Clean Air Act has been instrumental uh, in this country. And I'm wondering, uh, with the relatively recent gas drilling uh, in Wyoming, uh, and I'm from Pennsylvania in the Marcellus Shale, uh, it it's, could be a challenge. Could you talk a little bit about that, please? Well, Charlie, it's an excellent question. Uh, it was out of my jurisdiction and skill work. Uh, my response is, is I know that water sampling in places like the Wind River was a red flag of the air quality issues in Sublette County. The Forest Service had been taking water samples in the Wind Rivers for decades and nobody paid attention to it. But the change of chemistry in the Wind Rivers certainly signaled uh, we had air problems in the upper Green River Basin as a result of the oil and gas exploration and drilling. Uh, and it, it it should be embarrassment to all of us that Sublette County has been the only, I believe I'm right, the only non-entainment winter community in the United States. Not uh, Salt Lake might rival that. Anyway, uh, that was certainly a red flag, a link with the water. We need to do more uh, with water. I know the university's focused on it, Dr. Burke is. Uh, they could answer that better than I have. Uh, certainly the chemicals that go in the air, the water is a good barometer. Um, okay, we'll go, we'll do Anne and then Anne? this person. Hold on one moment. I can Let repeat me, the question too. Let me pass this down. A report just came out yesterday or today saying that the leading scientists in America are saying that they are 95 percent sure that global warming is caused by human activity. And I just wondered if you could comment why so many people in the Republican Party say that global warming doesn't even exist. And I, I hear it a lot from my friends. And I just wondered if you could help me understand that. Sorry, John. <laughs> And um, I don't think the denial, in my opinion, is on climate change. Well, there is some. There is some. It's climate change. I've been to the Arctic enough and other places like that, even though I seem to be building in Antarctica, which doesn't quite fit the model. Uh, where I think climate change, the, the debate comes in is the impact of human activity and CO2 emissions, which is a small portion of this 
total amount of CO2 which goes into our atmosphere. Um, I think we all need to care about it. I think where, where the compromises have broke down, and there were compromises across the aisle on climate change, in my opinion, I'm no expert, it has to do with the cost and benefit and some of the strategies. Uh, what will really make a difference and what's the cost? Uh, admittedly, I'm a, you all, some of you will shudder, I'm an advocate of coal. Coal is important to Wyoming, built the schools in Jackson, built stuff we all enjoy, provides a lot of meaningful jobs. It provides America at a critical time with cheap and reliable electricity. So this this deal to drive coal out of our use, I think, is absurd. Uh, coal can be used cleanly. We just finished a plant in Arkansas that rivals any power plant in the country on uh, emissions. It's a 20% reduction on carbon, not as much as we'd all like. We built a demonstration uh, carbon capture sequestration in uh, West Virginia. Uh, uh, commercial plant, i.e. Peabody Coal. Uh, we spent about $250 million. It worked. We could not get regulators to pass the cost on to, to ratepayers. That was their right. But a company can't afford to put $250 million into a plant on behalf of their shareholders. Um, so my comments on coal, some of you won't like, but Two years ago in, say, in Texas, triple degree weather, I mean, every power plant was cooking. If we'd lost one old coal power plant, there'd been blackouts across the southern part of the United States. So I'm not saying we shouldn't all work on it. I had one of the first solar houses in Jackson Hole, Mary Kay and I did. It's still solar. We just added to it with, with solar on our uh, hot water. Uh, we all need to care about it. I know there was a group here in Jackson Hole not too long ago of geophysicists who said it's not carbon, it's ozone depletion. The models are, so you're getting a lot of noise in the system. There are other good scientists say it's neither, it's solar activity. So I think that just reflects it's a complex issue. Interesting enough, American emissions are down of CO2. The Europeans gave me hell wherever I went in the country. Theirs are up. They're burning more coal than ever before. Whatever we do in the United States, we have to remember that in China and India, they build a new coal power plant every three days. So what is the cost to American workers at a time our economy is troubled of what the cost of electricity is going to be and what's going to supplement it? We can do a lot of it with natural gas. And that is ongoing, but it's expensive and rates are going to go up. It's new pipelines, it's new technology. Uh, alternative energy has an important role, but it's been disappointing in a lot of fronts. I'll talk about that. But not a very good answer. But. John, it was a great talk, and uh, I commend you for praising the work that Republicans have done. And I think you were, in fact, too modest in taking credit for the accomplishments of Republicans uh, in many areas of the environment. But my question is this. Um, why is it that the Republicans get such a bum rap for the environment? Is it just the liberal media? Or is there some, something else going on? I ask you, perhaps, to speculate about that. I, I don't know. Uh, maybe Republicans don't like it in their image. <laughs> I, don't. Um, I think the media has something to do with it. Uh, I think they like to perpetual. You know, even my friends at the Jackson Hole Guide and Daily, uh, in promoting this little thing, they said, you know, Turner's going to try to vindicate and, and say the Repu try to prove that Republicans have credentials. And, and maybe that was to get you all out of here, but a little twist. 
that that's a contradiction. Turner's going to talk about conservatives and environmental records. That's, isn't that a little uh, contradictory in terms? So I don't know. I, we've got a good record, and uh, we shouldn't rest on it. Don't let the rascals rest on it. There's a lot more we need to do. Paul. All right. Paul, do you want? All right. uh, hi, John. Devra. Um, Debbie, I'm you? not going to let you get off the hook totally. I want to just go back on something. You know that in Pinedale, the farmers were the ones who first raised the alarms about fracking. There were bloated dead cows that were quickly carted away where they had drunk some of that water that got contaminated. Now, I know that fracking can be done perfectly. It often isn't. And as an epidemiologist, we've seen some of the consequences of that, usually just for, for the workers. Talking about the mix of energy and greenhouse gases, we can think about coal, we can think about natural gas. How would you, as someone who's so skilled at getting people to mediate, try to promote fracking in the right way in the right places so that we can move to less carbon intensive fuel, which of course natural gas is, given the fact that this state has such a great investment in the continuation of coal, an understanding that our, our natural gas really would provide much more of a benefit to the world and to greenhouse gas reductions. How do you see that happening in the context of the highly polarized environment that surrounds the fracking issue back east where we, I think, might all agree, fracking has been done in areas where it should never have been done, as opposed to areas of, of the West where it might be able to be done in a more sensible way. Well, thanks. I, I'm certainly no expert on fracking. I, I would comment that uh, another example where the conservative uh, Wyoming legislature and the Wyoming people got their act together. I read an article today where it's recognized that Wyoming has established what are model safeguards on fracking. Uh, it was one of the first states to uh, mandatory disclosure of the chemicals you're using. Uh, they have very high standards, and I think Governor Mead and the delegation has called on this administration, don't mess up Wyoming, don't water down what Wyoming's already done, out of cement drill holes and and the proper testing. Uh, there was a report recently out of this administration, an extensive report, that fracking done properly is very safe. It's thousands of feet below water tables. We had an incident in Riverton Pavilion where uh, neighbors were very concerned about water contamination. It seems that that data was, was not accurate. Uh, it's been looked at, looked at, and looked at. Um, you know, natural gas, uh, at a time when our economy is in the ditch, the natural gas revolution is really going to revolutionize America. Uh, those that want to displace coal, I, I would urge you that this drive coal out of the United States is not a good approach. It's not going to mean a thing to world climate CO2. But instead, strive for how do we take coal and ensure it's used as cleanly as possible? How do we develop the science? Uh, I believe there's a, a, a technology demonstration going down in southeast Wyoming where they're going to take CO2. Uh, uh, no, they're going to take coal and turn it to diesel using CO2. Wyoming people have used CO2 for decades for tertiary oil recovery. You don't necessarily have to sequester this stuff, but we can develop the pipelines uh, across the country. A lot of CO2 can be used. You know, in the Bush administration, we advocated and passed, America was going to become the first country in the world to develop a demonstration commercial coal plant with zero emissions. Zero emissions. I remember I invited the Chinese over. They said, hmm, very interesting. <laughs> so they came over. The United States, what is it, 12 years later? We haven't turned a shovel on that. The Chinese went home and in 22 months built two of them. And their theory is, is they can take the CO2 
and put it in it now. Uh, I haven't been over there and checked on how it's doing, but that thing was up and popping in 22 months. We can do more with coal. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Turner, Bernie McHugh from Wilson. Um, as a wildlife biologist, as a young man, as a wildlife advocate for your whole life, and I think perhaps everybody here would agree that on the grand scale, America's wildlife is in trouble. What would you say to each person in this room to do tomorrow to help America's wildlife? Whoa. Well, I, I don't think I can adequately. There are so many people in, that I see out across this room, they're involved. They're involved in different nonprofits. They're involved in everything from cougars to wolves to grizzlies to whatever. Uh, I think this community cares deeply about wildlife. Sometimes I wonder if that uh, caring, um, if the focus is where it should be. But uh, that's just a personal opinion. Uh, we all enjoy it. There are so many good groups out there that are doing good stuff for wildlife, uh, from folks taking down fences to people building goose boxes to TU restoring uh, fishery habitat here on Flacker. Get involved in a group. There are some really very fine groups. They're very good sportsmen's groups. Uh, so whatever your your inclination and Ben is fine. Find folks that are doing something and become involved. Become, uh, become knowledgeable about the national issues, the state issues, local issues. You know, in Wyoming, we are really fortunate. We, we take for granted that we really do have influence. If one of us uh, speaks to our delegation, they usually read the letter, or we can see them when we go back there, or we can talk to them when they're in the community. Um, I remember as a float guide, and I was a state senator, people on my boat, they said, you mean your community, people could really talk to you? <laughs> you know, we wake months to meet a staffer of a state senator in California. And at the national level, a state senator or congressman, you know, how many thousand letters they get a day? Those of us here, we know our county commissioners, we know our legislators. Uh, you can give Grant Hill any time you wanted to. He'd pick up the phone, he'd answer your that's the way it should be. But in Wyoming, we're really blessed with being able to participate and being heard in the democratic process. And it makes a difference. I think Grant would agree. How many times I got a thoughtful letter from somebody here that really turned me around on an issue or, or made me wake up because somebody cared enough, they researched it. It's our job to listen. John, just to um, add to the thanks for, uh, from this community for your many years of public service. Uh, and then just wanted to go back and, and ask for you to take a, a look at uh, your vision of the wolf reintroduction. And where we, <laughs> so how you would, how you would look at, um, at how that reintroduction's gone. And also, if you and Harold have ever found common ground on that issue, your brother. <laughs> What Paul is talking about, uh, when I was director of the Fish and Wildlife Service, and I was working on the plan for reintroduction of wolves, a collaborative effort involving ranchers and hunters and defenders of wildlife and people in the Shree State region, I came into the office one morning, my deputy said, John, did you watch the news last night, the national news? I said, no, should I have? He said, you should have. <laughs> I said, why? What was there? He says, your brother was on television denouncing your plan to, <laughs> to reintroduce wolves. Um, I'm proud of the fact that after 20, 30 years of gridlock, we broke that and reintroduced wolves in Yellowstone. Uh, but I, I have mixed emotions in how it's turned out. Here in the West, when you give your word, it really means something. I went to the Western delegations who weren't happy with me 
But I said, there's a great national interest to return wolves to Yellowstone, to make them a part of the ecosystem. I someday, four mile bones go over the Great Divide. I'd love to hear a wolf uh, howl in the Teton wilderness. So I put together, and my staff put together a plan that tried to make partners with the people of the mountain states. How'd I do that? I used a unique section in the Endangered Species Act called an experimental population. That means they didn't have the full protection of threatened or endangered. An experimental population. That gave us the flexibilities to kind of deal with the states, that we had a biologically objective for Yellowstone and the three surrounding states, that to this day, the biologists tell me, is a sustainable numbers. I gave my word to a lot of Western senators and congressmen that this was the deal. This was the cap. When they reached the cap, they would be delisted and managed by those states, like we manage cougars and everything else. That was the deal. We had more public hearings across the West than any issue that's ever come before the Mountain West. And I remember the secretary called me one day and said, some in the Western delegation are jumping ship on you, John. The only way they'll stick with you is if you have more public hearings. And I remember I called uh, Ed Bangs and some of the biologists. I said, how are you guys doing? He said, Ms. Turner, we've had the tar beat out of us in every parking lot and bar in high school in Idaho and why in Montana our tires have been cut. We haven't seen our wife and kids in months. <laughs> I said, we got to do more public hearings. They said, please don't make us go out and do more public hearings. <laughs> I said, we got to saddled up, and they went and did more public hearings. Uh, I regret that we haven't kept our word to the Western states. My good friend Al Simpson still gives me hell because I didn't keep my word. I regret that the courts and some environmental groups have insisted on raising the bar and raising the bar and raising the bar. We agreed to manage these critters. A lot of people don't realize that federal agents, your tax dollars, have taken in excess of 800 wolves out of the population, those that are misbehaving. And we read in the paper today where a rare incident, but a guy lost 170 of his sheep to wolves yesterday. Wolves have impact. We have to manage them. The states can do that. Uh, we need to get them out from under the Endangered Species Act. Uh, Montana, Idaho, Wyoming have very conservative hunt numbers. Why not put them back under management rather than have government agents out killing wolves? Um, we could talk about wolves till then. I asked my biologist, I said, here's our biological cap for Yellowstone. I said, how long will it take the wolves to reach that cap? Oh, they said, Mr. Turner, it'll take 10, 12 years. Those rascals hit it in three years. <laughs> the habitat was so good. So I regret we haven't kept our word. Because in the West, keeping your word is important. Glad we have wolves, but I think we need to bring some common sense back, listen to the scientists. They're the best in the world. We can put these animals back under management. Thank you all for coming.
Why you? What are you doing? Are you taking some pictures? Oh, yeah, I'm uh, filming uh, ski, ski jumping. I think we should go with ski jump here, of course. Okay. I've been filming the U.S. Uh, champion ski jumpers on 